so if you don't mind, I'll just jump in with the sure. first one. The first one was uh, <clears throat> in a parish setting or really in any apostolate. Um, can you speak to the way that priests are called to be head and shepherd while also inviting the laity to participate in leadership? Um, and I think the the concern that's behind that question is the, the just concern that uh, we don't want to turn leadership in a Catholic setting into a democracy, right? It's that's not mm -hmm. the way the Lord established the church. Um, and yet we know from those two perspectives that I just talked about of uh, a, a priest can't do everything, um, but a priest mm -hmm. also oughtn't to do anything. So I know you've been involved in obviously in parish life, uh, but also in a lot of different apostolates. Can you speak to that concern? Yeah, so, um, so I, the life of the parish is in certain ways different from the apostolates. So mm -hmm. maybe sure. I would address that first because the life of the parish directly flows from the, the hierarchical nature of the church. Mm -hmm. And in that sense is so connected to the way the Lord established the church. And so mm -hmm. the fact that um, a, we have a pastor who's head of a parish to me seems to be right at the heart of what a priest, what the priest is. And, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that, you know, not every priest becomes a pastor or serves as pastor, but that's the main vocation of a priest is to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, a shepherd, head and shepherd. And so um, what that means is, in my understanding is that not that he's responsible for doing everything, but that he's responsible for coordinating the gifts of people in a unified manner towards the, towards where we're going. And so um, it just seems to me um you know, because you might ask the question, why isn't the church a democracy, you know? And, um, uh, you know, now I think we're a little bit more sober about democracy than we were maybe 200 years ago when we started this experiment, because we see some of the, we do see some of the struggles that can happen in democracy, which is you can have a lot of division and a lot of fighting and then politics and all that stuff. And um, the, the unity of the church, I do think, depends upon this idea that there's a pastor. And um, and that's why the Pope's the point of unity in the universal church, the bishop's the point of unity in the diocese, and the pastor's mm -hmm. the point of unity in the parish. And so as the point of unity, the pastor has to coordinate uh, really the vision and the living out of the mission of that vision. Um, but the way the best pastors do that, in my mind, is they coordinate it by understanding people's gifts. And so the pastor understands, I don't have certain gifts, and other people do have gifts. And... And so I'm going to try to use my lay people's gifts to be able to um, coordinate well um, so that as a team, we can go where we need to go, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I did talk about in the talk, the team approach, which I think works best, where and I think a leadership team of people who are helping the pastor think, who um, complement his gifts, who um, then can help him also to implement, but even, you know, it's part of this truth, which I can't remember if I, how much I talked about in the talk. I mentioned, I think the relationship identity mission reality. Um, so even that, the, the relationships are real, right? So in that leadership team, if there's a real communion in the Holy Spirit, where we share our relationship together in the Lord, and we are seeking holiness together and loving each other, in that then that's going to help us understand our identities very good so the pastor will always then be the pastor and able to lead easily because of the communion that happens where there's real love and charity and we'll be able to do our mission much better it's why the team approach is not accidental it actually supports a pastor in really healthy ways so it keeps him from sort of having to carry everything on his own and um you know uh it's not always easy to get that team together and to form them mm -hmm. and it's i think important that the team be based in some prayer and some real formation because um that helps it be a place where the holy spirit's working and not just a place where we're getting our work done you know and that's based on the relationship and some of that's just having time to be in relationship as well so um in a parish uh that's i think going to be always the way the church sees it um in an apostolate depending on the particular charisms of the apostolate you might have different leaders you know so for example um i'm involved with a lay apostolate called net ministries i'm the chair of their board um 
and the it's led by a layperson. And we were even discussing as that layperson's getting ready to retire and we're searching for a new director, should we have a priest there? And it, we actually decided, no, we shouldn't mm. because this is properly a lay apostolate. Mm. And it's always been a lay apostolate. And it's important for, although a lot of priests have come out of net ministry, some are even priests of the Diocese of Superior. Um, yeah. It's important for them to see a lay person at the head of this that there can be this kind of real lay leadership within the church that's making a great contribution. Now they're always under the church and they're under the ecclesiastical vigilance of a bishop who oversees them, make sure they stay Catholic and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I think in that word world of the apostolates, you can have um, different leadership. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that so, answers all the questions, but. Yeah, no, very much so. And, and there's um, a, a subsequent one of these talks is going to be on yeah. leadership with the team. But one one question that comes to mind for me just to follow up is um, our first talk was with Monsignor Shea on from Christendom mm -hmm. to Apostolic Mission. And it seems like uh, the thought of having a team help a pastor lead a parish uh, seems it seems novel to me. Like we, mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't have done that in Catholicism, mm -hmm. at least in the West 50 years ago, mm -hmm. 100 years ago, for sure. Uh, is that? Do you feel like that's a development of of the the Holy Spirit leading us into this new apostolic moment, or is that just coincidental? I do. Yeah, no, I do. I think. Well, I think two things about it. One is one of the things I like about Monsignor Shea's book is he also talks about teamwork with priests. You know that mm -hmm. that maybe given the the stresses that we're dealing with in the culture and everything, we ought to have places where we have two or three priests working together as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, which in my mind still would not preclude the collaboration with the laity and shouldn't mm -hmm. and i i do think that's one of the gifts of vatican too like the vocation of the laity in the church um that having a team approach with lay leaders can really is really one of the gifts that we couldn't have imagined before vatican ii um mm -hmm. but is really essential today given the way the church is made up mm -hmm. and i still believe that the main vocation of the laity is to transform the world not to transform the church <laughs> but right. uh but that being said you know the gifts of the lady are are needed in the work of evangelization and in the work of running parishes and and schools and all those kinds of things um it, it presents very real problems in terms of formation mm -hmm. and that's why i think the team approach is so important where you have prayer you have regular formation together you have uh, the vision of the church because many lay people just didn't have the luxury of the the level of formation that religious or priests had you know it's not mm -hmm. their own fault but you know, the church gave me four years of seminary. I got to take that in for a long time. That was a great gift. Not lay people don't always get that gift, and so we have to find ways to help them. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Um, a related question to the first one that was also asked by one of the priests that that took in the talk uh, was that Bishop Cousins mentioned activism and workaholism and the kind of underlying um, spiritual problem of Achadia. Uh, and that that really spoke to him, and I think that spoke to a, a lot of the priests and to me. <laughs> uh, but it mm -hmm. seems uh, the priest went on to say, it seems that in uh, Catholic culture, good priests are priests that get crucified by being stretched thin by taking on more and more and more. Um, mm -hmm. there's a, seems to be a, a, a sense of that. Um, so he said, please ask some some kind of question that would. Uh, ask Bishop to speak about how we can make our relationship with God primary in the midst of ever increasing duties and expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, on the underlying issue of Achadia is an issue of an obstacle to my communion with the Lord, right? That's what Achadia ultimately is. Um, St. Thomas says it's sadness about a spiritual good. And so when some difficulty comes into my life, um, I get sad about it. Um, and I get sad because I can't escape it. You know, St. Thomas says, first, I get angry if I think I can overcome it. Then I get afraid if I can't overcome it. Then if I can't either overcome it or escape it, I get sad. <laughs> and so um, that's just the way our passions work, you know. So um, that that sadness i have to be able to meet the lord there mm. and um when people meet the lord and are living therefore in communion with the holy spirit because of their lives of prayer 
they are sometimes very active, very active, like supernaturally active. You know, I mean, Sandy Nations, when you look at what he did in his lifetime, he was supernaturally active, but it was not activism, mm -hmm. right? It was rooted in a life of communion with the Lord in prayer, which is very different. Mm. And so that's the key is discernment. Mm. And the discernment comes from being rooted in the Lord. When I'm rooted in the Lord, then I'm able to discern what's coming at me, which is the Lord's will or not. You know, mm -hmm. um, actually, one of the one of my favorite paragraphs of Vatican II speaks about this, and I think it's uh, paragraph 14 of Presbyterium Ordinus, mm -hmm. where it talks about the busyness of priests. You know, mm -hmm. and it basically says um, we need to learn to be rooted in the way Jesus was rooted, this so relationship identity mission, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is rooted in the father and he does only what the father tells him to do. And Vatican II basically says, we need to learn this kind of obedience and docility that Jesus had in his heart, which is based from the communion, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this, this is not easy stuff. And this is the stuff that saints are made of, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, um, it means having a real life of prayer and then discerning in my life of prayer what the Lord wants me to do and what he doesn't want me to do, hmm. you know, and, and when you look at the lives of the saints, they, they often prayed more, even though they were very busy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, you know, this is something I'm constantly growing in. I don't think I do it well. I'm, I'm constantly dealing with this question myself uh, because there are so many demands coming at me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to be able in good discernment to leave those demands unmet mm. to be able to be with the Lord. Mm. And that's going to ultimately be more fruitful. So my prayer is the pastoral thing I do par excellence. It's the first and foremost thing I do for the sake of my people is I pray. Mm. I told the bishop, the priest of Crookston that when I came here, I said, I can't guarantee I'm going to do a lot of things, right? I can guarantee I will pray because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be a man of prayer and that at least at least that's something I can give you that I will be a man of prayer you know mm. and as I as we push into that then the Lord supernaturally often does allow us to get things done that we wouldn't be able to get done or he mm. brings people to help us get things done and that's real faith mm. you know it's exercising real faith to say I'm I'm going to not do these 10 emails, which I know are screaming at me because it's time to go pray. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, when I make that act of faith, the Lord does work in that. Mm -hmm. And I can learn discernment where it's where I get that sense inside, you know what? I need to not do this now. Mm -hmm. I need to go be with this person or I need to go um, pray or I need to go work on this talk or, any, you know, this is the time to get this done. And the Lord can teach us that as we grow in our life of prayer and discernment yeah and it would you also add to that list i need to go go for a walk or i need to go yeah, absolutely, a absolutely meal, yeah. right like <laughs> exactly, it seems like exactly what i'm hearing have dinner with my brothers right exactly. yeah 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 um and it yeah. seems like in doing so um self-knowledge is really important like knowing mm -hmm. am i am i truly dying to myself to for the sake of the good or am i right. uh seeking a life correct. of leisure right <laughs> correct yeah absolutely and so yeah they're all there are extremes on every edge and it's, it's certainly a question of prudence and it is self-knowledge because that's activism can hide underneath a generous spirit you know it's like well i'm just mm -hmm. giving myself mm -hmm but I'm actually spinning my wheels and I'm not being effective because I'm not doing what the Lord wants. I'm just getting things done. Yeah. And that, that can be activism. And so to know myself um, and to practice good discernment is really key, which is part of knowing myself. I have to know like, what am I prone to? What are my weaknesses? What are the ways I'm prone to fool myself? You know, cause we all are. Yeah. I do think by the way, this is where for me, I've come to learn the value of my annual silent retreat. And I would put the emphasis on silence, mm -hmm. having that space um, to really be with the Lord and to deal with the deeper issues in my heart every year. And, you know, I did a 30 day retreat eight years ago or more in 2008, some more, but um, 
uh, having that space to really wrestle with the Lord helps one learn how to be in communion than the rest of the time. And that's really important. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, one other follow-up and then we'll get to the, the last couple. Um, it seems like in, in being discerning in that way and being willing to say no or not yet <laughs> to things, mm -hmm. uh, one, that will be counter cultural probably depending on who mm -hmm. who you used to be as a priest or who your successor in mm -hmm. the parish was but also it also seems like a gift to the to the parish uh to kind of give witness to a, a not clericalist approach to priesthood um, Correct. like i don't have to do everything and in right. fact i ought to do everything and so i am empowering people to do these things in my stead is that right does that resonate with you yeah, it's always, so God wills our limits. <laughs> he does. He gives us limits. They're a great cause of suffering for us, but he wills them. And Jesus himself had limits and accepted them, right? And how many mm -hmm. times did Jesus leave the sick unhealed and the hungry unfed? And he went off and prayed. And people, and they came to him and said, everyone's looking for you. And he said, yeah, but I'm going to go to the next village. Think of all those people <laughs> who wanted to see Jesus. And he walked away because he, he was doing what the father wanted, not mm. what everybody else wanted, you know? Mm. Now that's, you have, that has to be real discernment, right? That can be selfish attitudes or fear or all those things. I have to deal with that in my discernment. But, um, but it, it will actually, if I obey my limits and do what I'm supposed to do and let other people do it, it the Lord will use that in ways that mm. I can't see, you know? Mm. He's going to yeah. raise up other people to let them use their gifts because I respected my limits. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. And a, a priest at our parish gave a, a homily on the scandal of particularity a few years ago. And yeah. it was such, a, yeah. such an eye opener to me, right? And how um, our hearts like resist that because, well, we ought to be all things for everyone, right? That's scriptural. Right. <laughs> right. Um, this is where I well, do think um, De Cassad. In his abandonment to divine providence is the spirituality of the diocesan priest mm. i just mm. think it is it's where we have to live because especially for the diocesan priest you just never know what's coming at you in a day you know same thing mm -hmm. with the bishop yeah. and so you have to be docile before the will of god as it comes and discerning and saint uh, the Casadi talks in the book in the second half especially about what he calls a traits little mm. movements that the that the abandoned soul learns to follow like okay i need to go for a walk you know or i need to read a book now or i need to call this person and that's that's the discerning heart as one grows thank you um one last question just to wrap up uh the this priest says i am interested in comparing the two main ideas that bishop cousins expressed on the idea that apostolic fruitfulness comes from people who have a well-founded humanity and the idea is that the way we are able to pursue holiness and clarity and discernment is by accepting the fact that i am just a man with all my brokenness that beautiful story you, you told at the end there right see there seems to be a certain paradox here did bishop cousin speak into that yes yes um it's the paradox of the spiritual life um which is so I seek constantly to grow in living a balanced and virtuous life, mm -hmm. right? And um, that's my responsibility as a man pursuing holiness and discipleship. And so that's why I, you know, I make certain resolutions about my life and I try to live certain things. And I, I'm always examining my life, trying to grow in that. Um, but the fact is that the real holiness um, comes from what the saints call passive purifications. And so, hmm. you know, roughly the spiritual life can, and even our human lives can be split up into the, the active stage and the passive stage. Hmm. And so the active is all the things I do to try to follow the Lord and be balanced and, you know, eat well, and I need to keep growing in that and exercise and spend time in study and prayer and try to develop all that. The passive is what God allows and what God does. And that actually is more effective and provides the deeper purification of me. Hmm. And normally, the passive purifications often come in the area of failure or hmm. weakness. 
and you see this in St. Paul, right? The famous passage of 2 Corinthians 12, where St. Paul deals with a thorn in his flesh. He never says what the thorn in the flesh is, but it's obviously an unpleasant thing. And it's, it's some kind of weakness of, it's either physical or a person, or it's a, it's a spiritual or even a moral weakness that he has, mm -hmm. right? And he begs the Lord to take it away. And the Lord basically says, no, I'm not going to take it away because my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And that's the deeper lesson of the spiritual life that leads to the passive purifications that make me more spiritually fruitful ultimately, mm -hmm. right? So Ferdinand, the guy that I told the story about, he obviously went through that right in this powerlessness of, mm -hmm. that he has nothing and and is completely paralyzed and there must have been a lot of dark nights where he was cried out to the lord and said why why did you allow this you know but as he surrenders to this thing that he can't control which makes him so weak the lord works powerfully in that and turns him into a source of spiritual fruitfulness much more than the active all that he must have done in his life to be a good person right yeah. and so um it they're different stages of the spiritual life but they're working often at the same time too right even even as i'm trying to grow i'm also dealing with my own weakness and failure and the lord's using that for good and it's it's the beauty of the of the beatitudes it's all in there yeah. about poverty and sorrow and <laughs> humility and it's incredible. It's the most spiritually fruitful aspect. And that's where it's very important, even in our ministry to recognize, I have to do all these things. I have to try to get a leadership team. I have to try to teach well, preach well, but uh, I also have to be abandoned to the fact that the Lord's probably going to work most through my weakness <laughs> in my ministry. And he's going to do things that I, I, because he's the Lord and because I was surrendered, but that I didn't do, you know, yeah is there some of them are going to be through my mistakes <laughs> sure it, it, is there an example that comes to mind from your own life or just kind of generically for a priest yeah yeah um oh yeah like um you know it happens constantly for priests that you know you you spend a lot of time on a homily you come up with a really good one and then it's it's the one that you just didn't have any time to prepare you know that you kind of threw together that profoundly impacts people now <laughs> if you decide from that moment on well i'm never going to prepare my homilies again that's a big mistake right but mm -hmm. the fact that the lord works through this thing right or um or you know you plan some big thing and this is part of what i th think i talked about in terms of fruitfulness and effectiveness right you know mm -hmm. you plan some big thing and you and five people show up you know and it's easy to get caught up in sort of the counting of that um when in fact the suffering of that will often be more spiritually fruitful yeah. uh, in the long run. And so look at St. John Vianney, you know, like incredibly spiritual, fruitful man, but um, a lot of it came through just kind of hidden suffering, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I, the, just real quick, uh, my wife and I struggled with infertility for eight years and all mm -hmm. those years we were trying really hard to grow in holiness and be generous with mm -hmm. our time. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden we have four children and it's like we've grown in virtue and holiness tenfold in those in handful sure. of years <laughs> sure because right that's that's passive um that's that's a passive way that the lord is working on us and it's not about us like right. making a game plan for how we're going to better ourselves and <laughs> right right is, is that yeah. kind of what you're Although, getting at exactly and um yeah so it's often the Lord brings us to places where we're not in control Yeah, that he can then begin to work. And even though we hate those places, yeah. they're actually really beautiful places. And so, um, you know, I think that's the lesson of the, of the feeding of the 5,000, you know, mm. when the Lord says to them, you know, give them, give them something to eat. And they're also like, come on, we got five loaves and two fish. <laughs> and he's, but he shows them like through your poverty, I want to have an explosion of grace. Yeah. And I think that's true in our poverty, we can expect an explosion of grace. You know? yeah. Wonderful. Well, that was, that was all the questions that I had. And I, I don't want to take up too much of your time on your retreat there. 
Is, but is there you. anything else that comes to your mind? No, just gratitude for the work that you're doing. It's given me some great ideas for what to do in my own diocese. So thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, when you were moved to Crookston, it was like, um, I don't know what the Lord's doing with that move, but moving Bishop Cousins to a diocese not too dissimilar to ours. Excited to see what happens over there. <laughs> Praise God. Well, pray for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Likewise. Thank you so right. much, Bishop Cousins. I really appreciate yeah. it. God bless. We'll see you down the line. Bye.